Welcome to the Drinks with Jess podcast. This is Jess Brannis, your host, and this is where we bring the LGBT community together with its allies to share each other's missions and help each other grow. I hope everybody is enjoying the first signs of fall and not really staying home, but still staying safe and um, masking up if you feel like you need to. But if you are new to listening to the show, please go on to dwjphl.com for all of our social media links, links to some of our archive shows, and of course, your drinks with Jess Swag. And by the way, if you are interested in starting a podcast, let me know. Just go to brannisenterprises.com and I will be reachable on that website and uh, see if I can help you out because we need some voices out there. And uh, <clears throat> the woman who is joining me today, which I'm very excited about, knows all about getting people's voices out there because I have Kelly Commander of K2 Creative and PR, one of the funniest women that I get to enjoy chats and wine with. Um, but she is also the author of 21, which is an amazing book. She is a public speaker. She just loves to talk about imposter syndrome. And I think that's a wonderful, wonderful topic for today because I am staying out of politics. But if you noticed, Yesterday, because you'll be listening to this on Thursday, Letitia James nailed Trump and his kids to the wall. So uh, go on YouTube, check out her press conference from Wednesday the 21st, because it was probably the highlight of 2022 for me. But Kelly, my girl, yes. how are you? Thank you for coming on, because it's been a long time, because I was on your show that you had for a short amount of time. You were, yes. That was probably one of our best watched shows as well. Really? Um, yeah. And we, I mean, we promoted it everywhere. And talking to you is literally like talking to somebody that I've known for 30 years. And I think I met you maybe five or six years ago. Yeah, just about. Um, yeah. And we have stayed in touch. And I am so grateful for that and so grateful for you and your friendship and this opportunity. You're just freaking rock star. Well, I have been dying to get you on the show and have time to chat with me because you are amazing as well. And I guess when you first came on the scene was when I reviewed your book, 21. And for all the people who are listening, why don't you tell them a little bit about that book? Because I thought it was fantastic. Sure. Oh, thanks, Jess. That was actually born out of a coaching session with mm -hmm. one of my dear friends, Renee Dimache Farrow. I was her little guinea pig when she was in coaching school during the pandemic. And we did this whole thing where she took me on this journey five and 10 years down the road. And it was kind of like meditation. And we really just dug in and there were tears and it was, it was something else. And at the end of it, she said to me, I had my eyes closed. And she said to me, you have to give yourself a gift to yourself from yourself. What is that gift? And I said, it's a book that I wrote because I love to write and I've always wanted to be an author. I always joke that there's a whole landfill of like notebooks from my teen years with like poetry and stories I never finished and all that kind of stuff. So um, when the session was over and she kind of took her coach's cap off, she said, why is this five or 10 years from now? Why can't you write a book now? Mm -hmm. And I went on a tangent. I said, Renee. I'm not an author and, you know, there's a pandemic and I just started my own business and I have clients to take care of. And, you know, and she said, and that's no excuse. Mm -hmm. You're going to do it, do it now. And then she suggested an anthology. She said, it's a lot to manage, mm -hmm. but it's less writing that you have to do. Mm -hmm. So that was in, I want to say mid November of mm -hmm. 2020. I had a call with Corey Wamsley the first week of December. My um, girl. Your girl. I know everybody's girl. Um, first week of December, and I said, I want to bring 21, like 20 other women, 21 of us into writing an anthology, gave her all my ideas, and I just rambled like I'm doing right now, real excited, and, and she just kind of sat there, like, really calm, and at the end, she goes, okay, we can do this. <laughs> that's Corey. It that's, is. that's what she does. I mean, I've, I've worked with her. She has been on the show. I have, um, worked, uh, doing audiobooks for some mm -hmm. of her authors and i mean she she really is she's like that calm person but and she's brilliant brilliant well, and she I'll and she puts it brilliant. right there on the line you know i'll tell you how brilliant she is she helped me manage 21 headshots 21 chapters mm -hmm. an intro a bio a forward a cover uh amazon bestseller campaign all this other stuff from the time I talked to her the first week of December of 2020, the book launched April 21st of 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who does that? Yeah. Who gets a book that size out there that quickly? I mean, she has a timeline and 
she makes you stick to it and her process works. It yeah. really works. So, yeah. Now, now since, um, and I want people to know this because you, you are, um, the CEO, the founder of K2 Creative and PR. So obviously going through this, you learned a lot about PR, but you are actually also, um, your company and, and you specifically were one of the sponsors of the Drinks with Jess Pride 2022 Tri-State Tour, uh, which we had an amazing time. And I was, I was feeling old after it. I was feeling a little old. I was tired. But, you know, I'm sure that that going through this book process and as you you know, had launched and built your company. I mean, you probably learned a shit ton of stuff about getting your name out there, getting your presence out there. And I think now in this world, we need more people, more good people to get their stories out there, get their, their opinions out there, get their, you know, whatever it is to help start making change. So did that type of situation help you with your business now and what you're doing for everybody else? Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh, for sure. <laughs> Excuse me. Between, you know, mistakes that I made and expectations that I had that just were ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you think you you put this book together and you're like, oh, we're going to be New York Times bestseller. You know, realize that you have to sell like 10,000 copies on your launch day to get that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, I think Oprah's going to want to talk to us. <laughs> you know, Reese Witherspoon's book club. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> You just have all these high expectations and you really have to ground yourself and realize, grab your lowest hanging fruit, talk to your local news stations or local publications, mm -hmm. get on some local podcasts. Although I was on a podcast out of Sydney, Australia, mm -hmm. that was a ton of fun. Um, but talk to people like you who have a voice, who can get your, you know, get the visibility, get your attention out there. It's not all Oprah and Reese Witherspoon and you know, CNN and all these big, huge things. It's really helping people on a personal level. And to do that, you kind of got to keep it small. Mm -hmm. And it was hard for me because the chapter that I wrote in the book and the whole reason that this came about was because of me having the imposter syndrome. And my mm -hmm. chapter was called From Imposter to Inspiration. Right. And I go back, as you know, and I talk about, you know, not to give the whole book away or the whole chapter away, but I talk about how basically I was the gifted popular girl in high school who never finished college, mm -hmm. doesn't have a degree. And, I, and as I say, and as Corey kind of prompted me to say, like I took a more scenic route to a professional career. Mm -hmm. you know, I got married in that time. You know, everybody, when I was in my early 20s, everybody was getting married and having babies in their early 20s. So that's what I did. You know, my kids are 28 and 25 now and out of the house and kind of nice. You know, it's different, but it's nice. Mm -hmm. But I took that scenic route of working all kind of part-time jobs. And, you know, my first big girl job was at the Pittsburgh Business Times. And I ended oh, up yeah. staying there. Yeah. 11 years I was there. Mm -hmm. I also learned a lot there too. A lot about social media and public relations and just the media in general, working for a paper like that, that was so reputable mm -hmm. within the city taught me a lot about networking too and the importance of just being really true and honest and helpful whenever you're mm -hmm. meeting people because it's going to come back to you. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I wrote my first book, Twitter and Facebook existed, there was no Instagram yet, or if there was, I wasn't using it yet. And it, it, you, it was still like email. Like I, I don't even remember if messaging was even on Facebook yet, like instant message instant messaging. I don't even know if that was a part of it yet. Cause I was always in Facebook jail because between releasing my books and being at the radio station and we would always be plugging things. And I plug things to people all over the world and all these groups all over the country. And I, I must've gotten arrested in Facebook jail 17,000 times in like a year. And it That's was like, thing I have not had happen to me yet. It, it was painful. Because then I was like, I remember calling my my producer and the other host of the show, and I was like, uh, guys, I can't post any other marketing or promo things because um, right now I'm locked out for 30 <laughs> days. And that was all. That's I mean, long. Mm -hmm. It's 30 days. Yeah, and, and it happened when I started my podcast because my podcast originally was a blog before podcasting existed. So, you know, it's, it's really hard, but now you have so many different outlets and so much coverage. And sometimes and I know we'll, we're going to get into this in the second half, because this is really like, you're, you're the girl to talk to about this, but it was weird because I was a teacher 
now I'm this author, you know, best-selling author. Now I'm on the radio and I have this thing. And it's like, I feel as if, because I didn't, that was not my career journey. Although back in the day, it was supposed to kind of be, <laughs> but you know, you get talked out of shit. Yeah. Um, it, it wasn't the way I went to it. And it's very hard to sit there and say, okay, yes, this is who I am. And that's something that I want to cover with you in the second half, because I know that's like your main focus. So for the rest of you out there, I want you to stick with us because we are about to go in deep to imposter syndrome and, uh, stay tuned. We'll be back in a flash. The drinks with Jess is making a big splash. It's time to join forces and step outside of our comfort zones. There is strength in union. It's time for people to tell their stories and make a difference. That is what we aim to do. The Drinks with Jess podcast is where we bring the LGBT community and its allies together to share each other's missions and help each other grow. Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Bringing you amazing guests that cover a wide variety of topics and are inclusive to all cultures and communities. Join us on this amazing journey. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Drinks with Jess podcast. Again, this is Jess Brand is your host, and I'm here with Kelly Commander of K2 Creative and PR, one of my favorite, favorite people to talk with, laugh with, have wine with. Uh, we really do have some outlandish conversations. Yeah. And uh, but I loved in the first half of the show, we kind of went through your your book and and a little bit how it helped your your PR company. But you know, we're coming into a time where there are Hell, we, I watch it on the news every day, imposters, right? So, um, you know, we want to talk about imposter syndrome because that's your focus. And I think coming into a time, Pride ended, National Coming Out Day is coming up. You're a huge ally uh, of the LGBT and uh, you love your gays. I love I that. Uh, but, friends, you name it, I got them all. <laughs> yeah, I know, I love it. But, you know, it, this is a time where, I mean, I remember and know people who are much older than I am that kind of had to lead a fake life, whether it was because of laws at the, or the lack of laws at the time or protections or uh, the way society was. So imposter syndrome does not only have to deal with your job title or your work, but also just who you are and what society thinks you are. So speak to me about that for a little bit, because I'm sure every single one of us, it, I mean, from the time you're born, you go through some kind of imposter syndrome at every age of your life. Oh, for sure. I mean, calling myself an author was mm -hmm. difficult. I don't see myself as an author, but guess what? There's a book out there that <laughs> has my name on it. And I, you know, I, I ran the whole project and, you know, I think for me, I have not dealt with it as as a personal thing. It's more on a business slash education side. So I don't know mm -hmm. how much I can speak to the personal mm -hmm. part of it. Like you were saying, like there's, you know, a lot of people in the LGBT community that had to lie and, you know, people who have gotten married to a spouse of the opposite sex. And then finally, when things started to get the way they are now, where it's starting to be more acceptable and people are starting to understand mm -hmm. what it means to be gay, they're like, okay, guess what? Um, I, I'm not, Fit for this marriage. I'm not, I mean, I know people and I know of people that have gone through that, mm -hmm. you know, that they've had to live that lie. So I think on a personal level, I think it runs a lot deeper than, mm -hmm. than a lot of people. Cause I don't know about you guys. I know some of your backstory, but I don't know how old you were whenever you came out. You when know? I came out of the womb. <laughs> it's true. I never, I never hid myself. It just was never talked about. And when I was like, you know, you're in like elementary school and you hold hands with somebody and they're your boyfriend or your girlfriend. And then it goes into middle school. But like, I mean, I, I knew from the time I was in kindergarten that dudes were not my thing. I knew that. And so I never really had, and I said this on your show, I never really had a coming out story because everybody just always assumed. But back then it was just never talked about. Yeah. So, you know, in right. right. So in, in college, oh. you know, I mean, I still wore black t-shirts when I went to elementary school and a pair of ripped jeans and I was the coolest kid there and called it Did a day. Did you really? I can I, see little Jess in like a size seven, eight t-shirt. 
<laughs> yeah, so just like right now. No, seriously, I remember being in third grade in Mrs. Kennedy's class, and I got a rip in my jeans at recess. It looked really cool, and I had a black T-shirt on, and I had this um, green – um, and it had some kind of design on it, uh, button down on, I took it off and I wrapped it around my waist. I'm walking around like this. And fifth graders are like, I love those jeans. And I was like, that's right. <laughs> you have always, and that's another thing too, that I, I also wanted to make sure that we touched on is the confidence. Cause when we had wine over the weekend on our little zoom call, we were talking about people's confidence levels. Mm -hmm. You can be super confident because I, I, I'm not as confident as you sister, but I'm really? confident. God, no. The more I get to know you and the more I see you, I'm like, damn. But I have confidence. Don't get me wrong. Because I, you know, I do public speaking. I've, you know, gotten up in front of crowds and I've spoken and, you know, all that good stuff. And, you know, but you can still have imposter syndrome mm -hmm. on top of being confident. Mm -hmm. And people don't see that. So, mm -hmm. which makes me feel like a fraud when I talk about imposter syndrome. Because people look at me and say, well, you're standing up here. There's a hundred people in this room. You know, you got your clicker and you're back and forth and you got your PowerPoint and you're talking. So how can you have imposter syndrome? So I feel like a fraud talking about being a fraud. Does that make sense? You know what? It, it was funny because when I first started Brannis Enterprises and I started doing all this podcast production, it, it felt weird to call myself a producer, even though I produce shows for people all over the country and my own because I didn't technically go to the, to a school for audio engineering or anything. Actually, that's not true. I was supposed to. I was supposed to go to college for that, and I was going to be a music major and all that stuff, and then I changed course to foreign languages, um, you know, to make my parents feel better because it was safe, you know? It was safe. So so it was hard at first to call myself a producer, but I know my skills. I know what I do. I know how fucking long it takes to do some shows, you know? But, I mean, it it took a while for me to get get into that job title. And I think, like you were talking about, a lot of times with business – it's kind of like now after the pandemic, when people are searching for new jobs or switching fields, it's like, okay, I'm going to apply for this job, but I've never been in business operations or I've never been this or that. So, you know, they're going to look at this and they're not going to see the job title that the company is used to saying, but that doesn't mean that you don't have the skill. And I think a lot of companies also, because they don't give a lot of people chances, if they don't fit the mold, I think that makes people have even more imposter syndrome at times. I agree. And there was actually a statistic that I have in my PowerPoint about the percentage of, well, with men, if, okay, you're on Indeed, say, and you're applying for a job. Men will be like, oh, I don't have this. I don't have this. I don't have this. It's fine. I'm still going to apply anyways. Mm -hmm. There's a statistic of how many women, if there's just one box they can't check, mm -hmm. they won't apply for that job. Mm-hmm. Because they feel that they have to have every single qualification, every single ounce of experience that's listed on that job listing mm -hmm. before they apply for it. Whereas men don't do that. Men right. will just go on and apply, take their chances. Hey, if they call me, they call me. If they don't, they don't. Whereas with women, I think that we're so tuned to success and don't waste your time and don't spin your wheels. And you got to compete in the male dominated industry, which are most industries. I mean, I look at, you know, judge Katanji Brown Jackson, who's going to be starting soon on the Supreme court, you know, African-American woman, black woman, she's got more education and law experience than every judge on that court combined. And half of Congress were still giving her problems, but that's their neurosis and their craziness but i mean she checked more than the boxes that could even be listed on that piece of paper right you know what i mean and people were questioning her so imagine being the person who can't check all the boxes for a job whether it's a supreme court or a marketing position mm -hmm. that's gonna scare the shit out of you mm -hmm. because you're gonna get to an interview possibly phone zoom in person whatever and when they start to ask you questions mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't say here that you have this. Mm -hmm. No, I don't, but blah, blah, blah. You know, like I, I, people would question me when I was applying for jobs. I don't have a college degree. We didn't see where you listed your college degree. Mm -hmm. I don't have one. I'm sorry. We're only hiring college graduates. Really? Because the experience that I have, the network that I have mm -hmm. here where, and you know this, but I'm in Pittsburgh, the network that I have here, the experience I have would outweigh a piece of paper I would have earned in 1994. Mm -hmm. For what I do, 
Now, right. if I was a surgeon or a scientist or something like that, yeah, I should probably have a degree, you yeah. know, yeah. but I mean, and I've actually told recruiters that before, you know, please let them know that I'm, I'm disappointed to not get moved to the next level to at least let you understand who I am and what I'm about. You know, that, that college degree doesn't mean end all be all for everyone. Somebody said something to me, I, cause a, a lot of times I would apply for like reporter jobs or journalist jobs or like, you know, TV, you know, whatever. And I remember talking to somebody, and this was a few years ago, and I never put in my, I mean, I, I throw myself out there all the time because I just don't care. But I remember them saying, well, how are you going to do this if you don't have any experience? I said, I look good on camera. <laughs> like, what's, what's the thing with, and the I can, turn? and I can read. <laughs> yeah, I can read. What's the sun, the sun and the head turn thing Yeah, that you do? What is that? That's the, um. Oh, oh, what my, my product placement, person placement. Yes. Yes. Product. Well, I, yes. I make sure that my teeth are shining the right way and there's a little sparkle in my eye. I yes. do. Yeah. And it works. And it, you actually do it. It works every, every time. time. Mm -hmm. I know. I have to remember that I'm going to an event Friday night for uh, Pittsburgh Fashion Week. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to see if I can like align the stars at this rooftop event. And I look the same in every photo I take. Because when I lived in Pittsburgh and I was a dancer, whenever they would want to take pictures of our dance troupe, the the photographer had lined us up a certain way, and I've oh, and that was the best picture I've ever took. So I always I committed it to memory. I stand that way in every picture I take. Mm, I need that. Mm -hmm. I need that, especially now that things are opening up and have been opening up, and I'm actually going places and socializing and networking. And yep. I need that. I can coach you in that. How about Ooh. that? I, I, I should, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, actually, we're going to sidebar on this because I have a great idea, but we're, we're going to sidebar about this because I don't want to put it out there yet to the public because there's so much other shit going on. But, um, but what do you suggest to people who are feeling this way? Whether it's even financial mm -hmm. imposter syndrome, there are people who act like they have all this stuff. Like I'm happy that I can pay for my house, <laughs> you know, like just because you have a title doesn't necessarily mean you make a certain amount of money and then people get a little, I'd rather have a great job title. Right. Just, yeah. just because for me, it, it's like something like, like a podcast producer to me, it, which is more like me and is who I am at this point, sounds better to me than teacher when I was a teacher. Right. You know, it's different. It's unique, but it's fitting to me because that is now my job and that's my company. Yes. So what can you tell people, whether whether professionally or personally, that they can do to kind of start taking over that doubt of who they are or what their skills are, or if they're not enough? Because I, I, I am so tired because there are a lot of people out there still in the school year just started and kids feel like this in school. Like, what is it that at any age we can start doing to kind of override that brain mechanism? Oh. And now this is perfect because I have WTF tips. Oh, I love WTF. Yes. I say that every day when I wake up. <laughs> I do too. And every night before I go to bed, um, but my, my WTF tips, the W stands for wake up. Mm -hmm. The T stands for terminate mm -hmm. and the F stands for find courage and opportunities. So the wake up is literally what I'm saying. Wake up, like find your aha moment, find your reason, find your purpose. You know, for me, I want to help people. You know, most people, I think most good people in the world, they want to help other people succeed or help them get through a tough time or whatever that is. So whatever your aha moment is, and a lot of my aha moment happened in December of 19, when I found out I had type two diabetes and I had to change my whole lifestyle and my eating, I had to lose weight. I wasn't staying on insulin forever. Like it was a whole thing. I tell people, you know, once the tears dried and my pantry and fridge were restocked, I got to work, you know? Right. That was just not living a healthy life. You know, I wasn't moving. I wasn't getting out of the house. So a lot of my aha moment had to do with finding out that I was a diabetic and mm -hmm. figuring out that's what's been wrong with me all this time, why I'm feeling the way that I feel. Um, the terminate is the stop comparing yourself to everybody on fake book. <laughs> because you know damn well, most people only do the sunshine and rainbows and unicorns on Facebook. Not everybody wait till it becomes wait till it becomes virtual reality meta where like talk about how fake it's gonna be then. 
Yes. Yes. So, I mean, yes, there are people who have a great life. And of course, most people are only putting out there what, what they see is, you know, being good, making them popular, making them look good. I have a friend, Jesse, who's in the 21 book as well. She will post her kids making a mess. She will post her house being a mess. She talks a lot about her journey with um, body issues and her weight loss. She is a real human being on Facebook. Mm -hmm. find people that are like that to mm -hmm. be friends with. You don't want everybody who's sunshine and rainbows all the time. Right. Stop engaging with the wrong people. And for God's sake, stop the negative self-talk. Women are famous for this. My mom is does this all the time. Somebody will say to her, oh, Candace, your hair looks fantastic. And the first thing she says is, oh, oh my gosh, my roots, I have grays, it needs colored, it needs cut. Accept the compliment and give one back. You know, if somebody tells you your outfit's nice, don't tell them how old it is or how cheap you got it for at Target. Just say thanks. It's one of my favorite outfits too and move on. Because mm -hmm. if you're talking negative about yourself, what do other people think, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And then the find courage is using the W and the T for the F for finding courage and just, you know, do all of that and find your realities. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody has their realities. What are you good at? What do you love to do? And then what do you never want to do again? I was a bank manager for almost three years. I don't ever want to work in banking again. It wasn't my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. So if by some crazy chance, I need to go back out into the workforce and, and not run my own business or only run it part-time, I will not be a bank employee. I can tell you that right now. You know, you have to, you have to find those realities and realize that, you know, it's, it's courage mm -hmm. that gets you where you are and it's taking risks and taking chances and the answer is always no if you don't ask. You have to be willing to find opportunities and ask because yeah. if not, the answer is always no. I think that's the biggest thing. I think people get nervous about asking for help or like, um, like I, I know like even a business sense, like it took me a long time to go to friends and say, hey, this is what I do now. Do you know anybody who would need A, B, or C? And if so, send them my way. That was, that was one of the, hardest things for me to do. And most people, I mean, all of my clients, every single client that I have has been word of mouth, every single one. I have not had to do really a lick of advertising or anything because it's just word of mouth because they know how dedicated I am to doing it and how I work with the person. And it becomes more of like a family project than a, you know, whatever. Like that's just, that's but just think, how I am. And that's how I run things. Right. But think about this. You felt funny asking people to make referrals or you know, connect you to people or whatever. But how often do you spend your time doing that for other people? A lot. Right. So that's my thing too. You know, that's another thing with the book too. Whenever I put the 21 book out, I just assumed that everybody I've ever met in my entire life was going to help me promote this book. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have, you don't always have those cheerleaders that you think you're going to have or those people yeah. behind you lifting you up and pushing you. And that's okay. Because mm -hmm. it's not everybody's cup of tea. Right. But think about how many people you've helped. You deserve to ask yeah. for help too. It's not weakness. No, not at all. At I, all. Not at all. I, I think I think we're we're coming into a time, and I, I'm sure uh, you know during the pandemic, a lot of people learned how to ask for help because so many people needed it. So we were all on like the same playing field, and I think that had a lot to do with it. But you know, I just I want people to be out there and be themselves and and like you said find courage especially for those listeners out there you know like i said we're heading into um october and there's national coming out day if you are not in that situation if you've been trying to free yourself you know what get that courage and you have people like me you have allies like kelly that are here and we're your biggest cheerleader so you know i think that's just <clears throat> just, just a wonderful wonderful thing and a wonderful way to start the fall is by talking to you my dear because you are absolutely adorable and I just, I love you to death and I'm so grateful um, that you agreed to join me on the show because uh, I couldn't think of a better way to have this conversation and a better person to have it with. Thank you, Jess. I'm honored and um, invite me back every week. Absolutely. Where can everybody find you, Kelly? Uh, K2CreativeLLC.com. And then I also have a website that talks a lot about the imposter syndrome and my speaking gigs and it's just mm -hmm. kelly.commander.com. Perfect. And for all of you that are watching, you see that on the screen. And for all of you that are listening, you can find all that information in the show notes. Kelly, my dear, you are such a joy to be with. Every time I get to talk to you, it just makes my day. And for the rest of you out there, remember, it's time to vote. 
National Voter Registration Day was the other day. So if you did not get there and register yourself to vote, please do so because we need as many voices coming up in November as possible because we need to make some change. Kelly, thank you again. And for the rest of you out there, have a good night. We'll be talking to you soon.